Well, in the last video of the Mandukya Upanishad series, which you can see here, we showed that the state of taijasa, or dreaming, is the second state of consciousness after waking consciousness, jagrat. And in the tika, Shankaracharya quotes an excerpt from Brihararanyaka Upanishad. When he dreams, he takes away a little of the impressions of this all-embracing world, the waking state. So then I went to look at Brihararanyaka 439, and turns out that quote is just an excerpt from a much larger verse. That man has only two abodes, this and the next world. The dream state, which is the third, is at the junction of the two. Staying at that junction, he surveys the two abodes, this and the next world. Whatever outfit he may have for the next world, providing himself with that, he sees both evils, sufferings, and joys. When he dreams, he takes away a little of the impressions of this all-embracing world, the waking state, himself puts the body aside, and himself creates a dream body in its place, revealing his own luster by his own light, and dreams. In this state, the man himself becomes the light. So, this is very wonderful. And this verse is embedded in a much, much longer uh, sequence of verses and commentaries by Shankara, in which he explains in great detail the nuances and the features and the qualities of the dream states, of deep sleep, and of transcendental consciousness. And this is amazing. I mean, we've been going through Mandukya Upanishad, and it's amazing. <laughs> But really, it only points out the outline of the four states of consciousness. Here they are, our good old diagram, just in case you've never seen it, which if you've been hanging around this channel more than a day or two, <laughs> you must have seen because we put it in so many of our videos. Anyway, these four states are the basis, the essence the kernel, the golden seed, the egg of all human experience. So, I mean, these should be put in a book that's accessible to everyone, and everybody should read it when they're like 12 years old and have it explained to them by an expert. I mean... <laughs> You know, because this is about your life. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and transcendental consciousness, which are all operating and all available all the time. But we miss them because nobody ever pointed them out. Nobody ever described them in such a way that we could recognize and observe these states of consciousness in our own selves. So this is not religious doctrine. This is not theory. This is not any kind of conjecture or just reasoning. This is strictly experiential, existential, phenomenological observation of the self. Now, the problem in modern society is this knowledge, although it's available, you have to dig for it because it's covered over by so many layers of misinformation, disinformation, religious doctrinal propaganda and pseudo-scientific garbage that is peddled as knowledge, quote-unquote. 
But what is the essence of this knowledge? That you are the body. You are a piece of meat. And that you have to work very hard to make others rich. I mean, isn't that what our social conditioning is telling us? You have to go to school, get an education, get married, get a job, have kids, raise them up, and so on and so forth. The whole trap of materialistic life. Of course, we don't buy it. We've never bought it. <laughs> I was lucky. My mother, very early in my life, pretty much told me and showed by her example that this system of social engagement and social conditioning and programming is basically useless. It's worthless to the individual because all it does is cover over our real knowledge with a bunch of stories that if we dig into them, we find our total abstractions, total imagination. Uh, just like the snake and the rope. Here we go again, right? The snake is not a part of the rope. It is not caused by the rope. In fact, it's not about the rope at all. The rope is simply the screen, the substrate, on which is projected, overlaid, or superimposed, the imaginary snake. Imaginary means fabricated. It's fabricated by our own minds, and it's overlaid on the reality of the snake. Exactly the same thing is going on in human life on planet Earth today. That there is a reality, and the reality is based on four states of consciousness. Then there is layer upon layer upon layer of false, fabricated stories, which are projected or overlaid or superimposed on the reality. Hmm? The snakes <laughs> superimposed on the reality of the rope. The ego, the superego, the social structures, the political structures, the religious structures. All these stories that are superimposed on the reality of consciousness and being. So if we get rid of all these stories, if we simply dump them over the side and look at life with an unbiased eye, what do we see? Four states of consciousness. This is the reality. And although Mandukya Upanishad gives a great description of the four states, it's just a summary. It's just an introduction. The Karika, the commentary on that Upanishad, which is only 12 verses. I mean, how much can it say in 12 verses? But Godapad's Karika is 200 and some 205 verses or something like that. And it explains all these issues in a much better way more suitable to the Western mind because it's based on reason. But Brihad Aranyakopanishad, I mean, goes all out. And so does Shankar's commentary. Some of the verses of his commentary are like 30 pages long, well over 5,000 words. This is very deep. It's extremely detailed. And you'll find it's not at all imaginary. It's not fabricated like corporations and countries and religions and philosophies and, you know, your homework you have to do for school. <laughs> That's all bullshit. It's all a lie. It's all just a huge house of cards made of words. And as soon as you pull out, you know, it's like Jenga, you pull out the, the, the bottom lie, huh? all the other ones collapse. What is that lie? You are the body. 
If you simply nullify this statement that you are your body, that completely demolishes the entire fabricated structure of human society. So you should do that. <laughs> you really should for your own well-being and for the well-being of those around you. You should learn this philosophy very, very well and practice it in your life. And of course, what that practice looks like is different depending on your state of realization and your state of intelligence and so on and so forth. But basically, you should follow the Vedic path because the most ancient religion extant in the world today has the most complete knowledge of the actual human condition. And not just gods and goddesses and rituals and words upon words about imaginary places, people, stories, and so on, but real descriptions of what it is to be, to exist, to be a human being. And every day, I, I'm not going to tell you my confidential dreams and realizations and stuff like that, because those are better kept private. But I can tell you every day something happens or I experience something that confirms all these observations that gives me tremendous certainty that this knowledge is true. It's not just true. It's fundamental. It's foundational. It's the basis of real human civilization because it describes the actuality of the human experience, the human existential condition. You know, 12 years ago, we started this channel with a series on being in the world, which you can see here. That series was a review of being and time, one of the greatest works of existential philosophy by Heidegger. And in all this time since then, really what we've been doing is just going deeper and deeper into this description of the human existential condition. And as we peel away the layers of indirection, misdirection, disinformation, propaganda, doctrine, and politics, and all the garbage that's been piled on top of it, we find that these descriptions in the Upanishads are the most essential of all because they lead to complete freedom. What does freedom look like? It means not believing in the stories that we're told by so-called authorities who are actually not acting in our best interests at all and whose intentions are simply domination and exploitation of the population. Real leaders, if we had them, would institute uh, foundations and seminars everywhere, simply broadcasting this real knowledge of the actual human condition. Because this is the knowledge that leads to the end of knowledge. That knowledge, knowing which, there is nothing further to be known. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.